Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Bogdan. I'm the chair of the Sustainability Committee for IFMA. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is a joint webinar with IFMA NYC and BOMA NYC. We'll be discussing how indoor air quality affects viruses and what FMs should prepare for when planning for our day, which is a return to the office day instead of return to work. Um, we'll also be discussing how energy efficiency measures and smart planning can offset the added costs of running HVAC systems more aggressively than before the pandemic. Uh, everyone is on mute except for the speakers. If you have any questions, please ask them in the Q&A chat bar and um, Michaela or Kaylee uh, will choose the most common themed ones and we'll have the panelists answer those today if there is time. Um, if people have to leave early, we'll be providing a link uh, to the recording and um, we'll be sending that link out to all respondents with uh, also answers to the questions that we're not able to get to today, as well as useful links um, and the panelists' contact details. So please let me introduce our panelists. Um, Christopher McHugh, there we go, um, is partner at AKF Group and a member of ASHRAE. Debbie Jaslo Schatz is facility management and sustainable sourcing expert and is also the past president of the IFMA New York City chapter. Uh, Des Green is managing principal at WB Engineering and is also a member of BOMA. John Leitner is principal at Environmental Building Solutions and is also a member of BOMA. And Richard Druin is managing principal at Elementa Engineering and is also on the Code and Regulations Committee at BOMA. Welcome, panelists. Good morning. Morning. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Good morning. Of course. So, um, to get things started, uh, Debbie, uh, I want to ask you what should facility managers have on their checklist for re entry into the workplace? Well, the first thing that you should do is contact your landlord or property manager. You want to make sure that they have a plan, find out what their plan is, and find out if you can dovetail it. Can you utilize the same service providers? Is there a way that they can do a charge back for you to be able to get your building up to speed with what needs to be done? You also want to find out if your adjacent tenants have programs that they're doing and is the landlord aware of those because you want to make sure that everything's consistent within the building. Then what you want to do is make sure that um, you find out if the building has any restrictions because some of the buildings are very specific as to what types of um, cleanings and what types of upgrades that they will allow and who they'll allow into the buildings because of various security issues. So that's why it's important that you talk first to your landlord. As a facilities manager, my mind obviously goes to what I would do first, which is to engage an environmental contractor. You wanna be able to test your air quality, you wanna be able to test your water. And if you have previous test results, you'll wanna use those as a baseline to see what kind of changes have taken place. Because you have to keep in mind that your building has either been shut down or your office has been shut down, or it's been operating at a capacity based on essential personnel in the building. So things aren't running at full blast and um, this is gonna affect some of your test results. And you may want to, after you have your test results, um, uh, you know, make sure that you give that information to your, to your cleaning contractors and to your HVAC contractors. And just a sidebar note about things with your cleaning contractors. I know we're not going to discuss cleaning and all of that. We want to, you know, that's been done on other seminars. But the one thing to be careful of is when you're disposing of your um, janitorial <coughs> waste, that when they're putting things down the, uh, you know, the, the slop sink, they're not using these harsh chemicals because some of these chemicals can corrode your plumbing and then you'll have other issues. So these are all things that you, know, you wanna ask and make sure. The next thing to do is to consult your uh, HVAC contractor. Um, they're, if they're the most uh, familiar with your systems, if not the engineer who you work with, you want to bring in and have them do some type of an assessment 
to make sure, number one, everything's operating properly, and number two, based on the results of your air quality testing, what needs to be adjusted, because we may have to, you know, change and our panel will go into the details of what needs to be done to ensure the air quality is consistent throughout your building and that it takes into consideration that your re-entry may be a phased approach. So mm -hmm. you might have essential personnel for day one, you might have 25% of your staffing for the next go round, and it may take several months till you're at full capacity. The other thing that you want to do is make sure that all of your recommendations between your HVAC contractor and your um, engineer have been reviewed with the building engineer so that everybody's on the same page. And mm -hmm. obviously when, when modifying and upgrading, you want to follow the OSHRAE guidelines for efficiencies and making sure that you're conscious of local law 97 because that's something that's near and dear to me and to a lot of other people in the New York area. So make sure that you're keeping that in mind and, and, and being thoughtful of you know, what needs to be done between your space as well as your landlord's space. And one thing that a lot of the people that I've talked to have been leaving off of their checklist that I think is important is to talk to your insurance broker to know what's covered in your policy and what's not, specifically if you have business continuity or business disruption policies, because in some cases, it won't only co it'll cover not only your business losses and your potential personnel issues, but there might be provisions for getting your space ready for re-entry and the operational. So when, you're, when you talk to your broker, he can best advise you on what you should or shouldn't be doing based on what your policy says. And he may even make recommendations for future policies because we know that this is day one of Corona and there's the possibility of a day two. And lastly, make sure your communications to your workforce is consistent, not only about what your company is doing, but what your building's doing. Because you want everybody to have that comfort level that when they do come back into the building, it's gonna be a healthy and safe environment. Just remember, don't overdo it because I'm hearing lots of stories where you know companies are doing blasts four and five times a day. That's mm -hmm. overkill. I've also heard where there have been companies that send out daily uh, monkey surveys to see, you know, have you come in contact with anybody? Um, you know, are you running a temperature today? And if you say yes to any of the above, they're telling you to continue to work from home so that you can protect the rest of the people in your workspace. So those sure. are the key things on my list that are not on what I would call the standard lists that everybody else has been talking about as far as cleaning and 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 being, you know, making sure you disinfect it and things of that nature. So I'm sure. leaving that out intentionally. Okay, Jessica? great. great. Um, Christopher, uh, can you tell us about ASHRAE's position papers or standards that all engineering firms need to comply to? Sure. Um, ASHRAE has for a number of years been on the forefront of research and performing all, all kinds of research with regard to energy and air distribution. And there is um, ventilation standard 62.1. There's the energy standard, which is 90.1, which folds into the energy code in New York City. Um, it's a compliance pathway. But most importantly, for what we're talking about now, ASHRAE has developed the whole COVID section on their website, um, ASHRAE.org. Org, and they've been um, posting consistently since February. I think the um, one of the position papers that I think might, might be of great interest to the membership here is the building readiness reopening guidelines, which if they go on ashray.org and just search for COVID-19, they can bring up that paper. There's also a paper talking about the relationship between COVID-19 and HVAC and buildings. And um, it outlines um, some very practical stuff that you can do. There's a facts section, questions and answers that people have chimed in and you can scroll through and actually maybe get some answers to some of, some of the questions. And um, ASHRAE is continuing to update stuff every day, so. Wonderful. Yeah, we'll make sure that there's a link um, in, in yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what we send out to I'll everybody send who's responded. 
I can send yeah, you a series of links. So okay. I, I will put Wonderful. that together. So um, Des, uh, can you minimize the spread of a virus through an air filtration system? Um, uh, yes, you can, uh, Jessica, to a certain extent. Um, just following on from, uh, from Chris's um, uh, introduction about the, the ASHRAE papers, there are a couple of short and long-term um, procedures that you can do in your building uh, to prepare, or while the building is, is uh, partially occupied and to prepare for uh, post R day. Uh, we'll go into those in, in more detail here. Uh, one of them is dilution ventilation, uh, which is flushing your building with 100% outside air. And the other one is increasing um, the MERV uh, rating on, on, your, on your filters. Um, go, to go back to the question, can you uh, prevent uh, viruses going through the, the system using filtration? Um, you can. Um, increasing one of the recommendations from ASHRAE, one of the, the, the recommendations uh, to improve indoor air quality is to improve the, improve the or sorry, increase the MERV rating of the filters. Um, so buildings that have been built in the past 10, 15 years uh, may already have uh, MERV 8 and 13 filters in the systems. Um, buildings of, a, of a, an older, say vintage, uh, may only have uh, MERV 6 to 8 uh, filters on them. So uh, the idea is to increase the uh, filtration rate as much as possible. Um, it will it will capture a lot of the particles and a lot of the, the viruses and bacteria ride on dust particles and other particles that are trapped by the by the, by the filters. So it will go a long way to improve IAQ and to um, to capture some of those uh, viruses. Okay, so one of I'm just going to talk specifically about the MERV filters. So the MERV fifteen that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that they're they're good, but old HVAC systems might it might cause harm, is my understanding. Um, to in, uh, it, when it's increasing the load for an old system, mm -hmm. it can it can sometimes be uh, detrimental. Can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah. So so before um you know you you, you put in the higher uh, higher rated MERV filters, uh, there's a couple of things you got to look at. Um, they do or some of them do have a higher pressure drop across them, especially when they get loaded or dirtier. Um, so you have to make sure that your system can accommodate that higher pressure drop, uh, which is something that an engineer can take a, a look at uh, for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then you have to assess if, you know, if you're overtaxing your system in the, in the short term, is it, is it maybe worth it for a month or two while people are coming back into the, the workspace? Maybe your system isn't fully designed to accommodate a MERV 13 or MERV 15 filter when it's fully occupied or full, you know, running at, at full load. But since the buildings are probably not going to be fully occupied for another at least two, three months, then maybe 20, 30 percent, maybe you can run your system down and, and accommodate a higher filtration rate that you normally would. Understood. I just want to add so, to this. Um, yeah. uh, people might be on this, uh, asking the question, what's the difference between the MERV filter and the HEPA filter? And uh, the, the difference is that the HEPA filter is, test, is tested with uh, more stringent than uh, the ASHRAE standard. So that's something to, uh, to understand. Mm -hmm. Ah, I didn't know that. Okay. I could also add if the, the, um, the um, a lot of the building wellness standards and then the well building standards require MERV 13 as a minimum standard and LEED does too. So a lot of the systems as Deb mentioned, may already incorporate some of this filter technology already, so. Okay. So um, I, I've been hearing a lot about UVC light as also um, an opportunity to disinfect the HVAC system. Can you talk a little bit about that, whether Des or Richard? Yes, uh, the UVC light has been uh, uh, known to uh, prevent the viruses to reproduce itself or it disables it. Um, and uh, the best place to put this uh, UVC light would be uh, in the air handling unit. And it has also the other benefit of uh, killing any mold or bacteria that is on, on the coil in the uh, air handling units. Um, we also talk about the, uh, what they call the in-room upper level uh, UVC lights, uh, UVGI. And these would need to be installed above seven foot. And they, they help uh, kill any uh, bacterial viruses that are floating up in the, in the space. You have to be careful where you place them, of course, because they can do some damages to uh, eyes and skin. Yeah, I, I, I just just to, to uh, uh, add to that point, that's that's a 
It's just been historically been used in um, sterile areas like in hospitals, uh, surgical areas. Um, you got to be really careful if you're even considering that in an office or commercial space because because of the control of it, it you know, long term um, uh, exposure to it can cause you know health problems. Uh, you got to you know you may you know your your office may be closed at five o'clock, but you do have other personnel, cleaning cleaning staff and maintenance personnel who will be entering the space. So you just got to be careful if you are considering that. Understood. So um, there, these are really two uh, energy questions. I mean, if you're going to be flushing the system with outside air before occupancy um, and shifting your systems into full air mode and increasing your outdoor air damper positions, etc. Um, and also this goes to the UVC light, what is that doing to your energy consumption in the space? Yes, obviously, um, initially we'll have, we'll have a reduced occupancy. So the increased ventilation might be offset by the reduced occupancy in the space. So there's less people, less energy use and less heating and cooling requirement. Um, where there's an impact on the increased outside air ventilation will be of course in the summer and the winter when there's a, a greater need to reheat or, or cool the, uh, the air coming in. But in the off season, it might, it might be uh, actually beneficial. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify that, Jessica, just, I don't think we explained the dilution ventilation uh, procedure. Basically, if you have a, a system that has uh, ability to go 100% outside air or has a 100% or airside economizer, the idea is to open your, your, your outside air dampers 100%, have all your exhaust fans on and flush, flush the building um, of, um, of stagnant air with, with clean outside air, clean and in inverted commas outside air. Um, and the recommendation by ASHRAE, uh, while the buildings are unoccupied, is to run that as much as possible, um, especially you know with the, the days and weeks coming up to um, our day, you really want to flush your buildings with, with clean air. Um, so that's as, as Richard alluded to that. That's something that uh, should be considered probably as part of the procedure. Maybe nighttime flushing uh, as normal uh, sequence of operations in the building. Yeah, and obviously, if you increase the outside air to the building, you have to make sure that you're exhausting uh, more as well to not overpressurize mm -hmm. your building. So in terms of the prioritizing these actions, your, your thoughts are without a doubt flushing these systems, kind of what Debbie was talking about. And do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, the obviously the, the first priority is, is the uh, health and safety of any of the occupants and tenants going back into a building. Um, I think that, you know, you know the, the way that ASHRAE has outlined these uh, recommendations is, is very practical. Um, even if you can't run a 100% outside air flushing, you can maximize whatever you have in the building and, and run that as often as possible. Uh, maintain that in, um, you know, we talk about uh, supplemental units as well. That, that's something that you should uh, take a look at. You know, obviously a lot of, Supplemental units may be uh, throughout your space. Uh, you should run those. Um, so I think, um, um, I guess, priority and, the, and the, the most basic things you can do is, is dilution ventilation and seeing if you can uh, increase the MERV rating of your filters. Even if it's, in, if it's a short term and your, your, your unit may struggle a little bit, I think it's worth, um, worth investing that. I don't think it's a huge amount of money to do that in your systems. But to, to, to bring back what Debbie was saying is don't overdo it. Um, make a plan and look at what type of occupancy you'll, you'll be, you'll be mm -hmm. getting uh, to re-enter in the office. And maybe this is your limiting factor. Maybe you're, you look at what your HVAC system can do and limit the amount of people that can come back in the office and who can work from home, they can stay home. If I can sense. just add something to that, um, you should be looking at disabling the demand controls ventilation systems. A lot of the newer systems have been designed with CO2 sensing. That should be disabled because that's going to limit the amount of flush through. Plus also look at all the time clock scheduling for all the systems. A lot of these buildings you're going to have to go in and manually override to make sure the exhaust fans go on and, and, and really understand what the BMS is doing at different times of the day. That's good advice. Um, John, uh, I wanted to ask you, so what specific measures should be taken if you find out that someone who's working in the building has tested positive? Sure, and this, is, this has happened in, in a lot of buildings that um, you know, we work in 
over the past couple of months. Um, you know, the first thing I would say is, you know, coordinate anything you do with HR. Um, and, and then secondly, I would do some internal tracing to try to identify who that person has been in contact with and let all of those people know um, of the event. Uh, and then, the, you know, the final thing is to do the proper cleaning, uh, isolating the area and cleaning it in accordance with CDC protocols. Great. Okay. Um, now, here's a question. Should FMs be conducting more frequent air quality testing? And will this information be expected by occupants for them to feel safe when they go back to the office? Um, I'm going to start with the second part of that. I, I'm going to think, um, you know, with my history and our history in the, in, in the city, that people will expect that. Um, mm -hmm. Give them a, a little more feel good, um, knowing that they have to come back. Um, the question becomes, is traditional IAQ testing something that's truly applicable in a situation like this? Or should um, FMs be thinking about doing specific COVID-19 air testing and surface testing, which is available? Um, and so some of that depends on the sensitivity of the, the actual um, occupant. Okay. Um, okay, so... Uh talking about a little bit with the testing and are, are there devices or equipment to measure the indoor air quality and adjust to accommodate a specific goal like closing off vents if something harmful is suspected or if there's a bad smell? Um, there are IAQ devices um, that exist today. Um, um, they spoke about demand control ventilation, which is a CO2 sensor, which controls your um, HVAC system to some degree. So that's one example of that. Um, we did a project after 9-11 in a building downtown that opened up and they put a particulate monitor in every outside air plenum. And they wrote a program that said if the outside air particulate level um, got to be above a certain point, they would shut the outside air dampers down. And, and so that's an example of, of something other than demand control that can be done with an IAQ sensor. Um, sensors are getting much more um, robust, they're getting smaller, they're getting easier to use and install, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, so there's a lot of things that can be done, it's just a matter of complexity uh, and cost. Okay, um, can I bring later now? <laughs> I, uh, I, I'd love to hear what you have to say about <laughs> the Internet of Things um, and how that's gonna drive the next generation office um, environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you could talk about some of that and, and you know, if you could share with, with Richard or Chris. Yeah, I mean, I'll start, I'll start the conversation. So, you know, <laughs> IoT is on a macro level is, is the billions of different devices around the world that are connected through the internet. Um, on a micro level in an office or a building, um, if you just think about the devices that you have connected to your computer, you have a printer, you have a server, you have label makers, you have all these different things that are connected by ethernet cable. So imagine installing an ethernet backbone and connecting anything to it. So you can connect a VOC sensor, you can connect a temperature sensor, you can connect all these different IAQ devices, um, and then they're gonna, they're gonna gather data and that data is gonna go somewhere. And I think the future of this is the, the brain behind that. So what does that brain do? What does the artificial intelligence do when it sees all that data and how does it control the office environment and make it run the best for the occupant with the least amount of energy and cost. And I think that's where this is going. Do you see uh, this ever being something that people can um, get alerts on their phone so it becomes more personal? Um, you know, this happens now. It happens now. It's being done in buildings now. Oh, um, okay. So yes, the idea is that you can have an app on your phone and if you're sitting at your desk and you think it's a little bit hot or a little bit cold, you know, ultimately there might be a way for that to be adjusted for you personally. Interesting. Okay, so um, the other kind of aspect of indoor air quality that we're dealing with right now is, is the, um, the intensive cleaning that the CDC is suggesting. Uh, and, and there are maybe some concerns with employees coming back that, that, that the fumes from those intensive chemicals um, may be harmful. Uh, what would, 
you guys do um, in, a, in, in, in HVAC to, to try to mitigate that? I guess depending on, on when the, uh, the cleaning is done, uh, Jessica, you know, going back to um, a flushing or a dilution cycle of the building would go a long way to get rid of not all, but most of those smells and odors out of the building uh, because you're just flushing with outside air and exhausting uh, directly outside the building. Um, if it's if it's available, 100% outside air is available in the building. If not, uh, you, you know, again, you run the, the outside air as, as high as possible. That's one thing you could do with the uh, HVAC system. You're the smart also, way to do, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was just gonna say, if you could add, you were on the technology angle. We've done systems where you can put in sensors and monitoring where if there's a particulate matter or something going on is in a package room, this is formaldehyde or whatever, you have a system that can send you alerts and can send it on the phone and tell people not to occupy certain areas. And you can take a look at that and integrating that as a holistically level of running your business. And um, we've done it in spaces now. So the technology does exist. It's costly, but it does exist. So, and it's, but it's becoming more prevalent. Um, it's part of some of the well building guidelines and some of the lead guidelines. Um, anyway. Yeah, the air contaminant sensors that look at uh, uh, contaminants outside you know, beyond uh, CO2 levels will, will, will help you better, uh, you know, provide the outside air levels that you actually require. And instead of over ventilating, you can, or under ventilating, you, you just provide the right amount of outside air as, uh, at every moment. Yeah. So Richard, this is, it's a perfect segue to my next question. Um, what kind of upgrades will benefit both employee health and also reduce energy cost or, or energy use? I mean, can we discuss some of the devices that are on the market that can connect to a, a BMS system, which is a building maintenance system? Well, so like John mentioned, the, these uh, particle um, sensors uh, would be helpful. Uh, having also air, air flow monitoring stations on the outside air to know exactly how much air you're bringing from the outside uh, will help you uh, with that. Uh, of course, if you want to push a bit uh, further, um, decoupling your ventilation system from your air conditioning system uh, is, is, is helpful on the uh, energy side because now you can vary your ventilation air without ha having to change your, the amount of air conditioning you're providing to your space. You can do both separately. Okay. Um, and also, Richard, this is, this is also for you, but please, anybody else, chime in. Um, is there an infection control benefit to employing an overhead distribution, distribution system that pushes air down towards the floor rather than an underfloor air distribution system it was a mouthful. Well, that's a, that's a tough one. So we're talking about the overhead distribution system versus the underfloor distribution systems. Um, there's some testing being done right now at the uh, University of Berkeley that shows that the underfloor can help uh, reduce the um, infectious disease uh, transmission, but it, it's very uh, slightly. Uh, air air effective, effectiveness is, is what needs to be done. So the location of your diffusers on the supply side and on the return side, <clears throat> mostly more importantly on the return side, where you extract the uh, dirty air from the space is, is uh, important. You want to make sure that there's no areas in your space that uh, where the air is stalling and uh, you know, viruses or uh, bacteria can, can just float around and stay in one place. That's a, if I can just add, that's a, that's a great point because it becomes a, as HVAC engineers, we strive to get mixing of the air and the temperature and everything else. And the underfloor systems actually drive the air up and then return high. So they pull the air out through the breathing area rather than the overhead pushing the air down. So I, the testing is, um, I'm curious about the testing because there's been some other testing with aerosols and mixing and particle sizes. So, um, to be interesting to see. I think it's also, also Chris and uh, Richard, when, when, you, when you read or through CPC or any of the scientific papers, the, the one thing that they do um, uh, discuss in, in great detail is, is airflow across the breathing zone. So as long as you, you have air, uh, airflow across your breathing zone is really important. Whether that comes from, it's, it's, it's better from above or below is, I guess, it's going to be a uh, result of a testing. So the jury is still out in terms of people who have existing raised floors and, and things like that. They shouldn't be worried 
until we know. Um, I don't know I if it's that much of a concern, but it's, you yeah. know, with the, with the testing, it'll, it'll, uh, it'll really. Okay. Show. Okay. Um, so uh, this is a question for John. Um, we know that the virus is spread through uh, bodily fluids like droplets in our lungs via sneezes and breath vapor, um, hence the use of masks and social distancing. Uh, to prevent the spread, but can we talk about how human circulation within an office space can affect the spread? Well, how think, would you control that? Yeah, so those, the control is is similar to would it be you know outdoors in a in a public space. So um, it's it's not only just it's it's proven now not only just to be a, a coughing sneezing um, uh, transmission uh, route. You know that you cough sneeze you can um, touch a surface touch a face. That's another transmission um, mode. Um, it's also been now been designated as an airborne transmission. Um, and so the measures are masks, social distancing, you know, to the extent that you can, uh, hand washing, all of the sanitizing things that we've talked about um, all along by New York City Department of Health, the State Department of Health, and CDC. All of those things still come up to, into play in the office environment. Of course. So uh, Debbie, I mean, I, I've, I've seen some stuff um, just in doing research for this webinar where uh, they're creating traffic patterns within the office. Yes, there's is a lot of companies that are thinking their, their thought pattern is that you create one-way zones. And so instead of having your um, cubicles go all the way to the window, you create an aisle space so that you have everybody moving in the same direction, just like you do in the grocery store, up one aisle, down the ex next aisle. Uh, some people are, um, you know, taking in the bathrooms every other stall and closing it down so that they can limit all of the circulation and people having to pass one another in coming in and out of the stalls. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's really kind of interesting to me because I've even seen where one company changed their carpeting and put circles, six foot circles around the workplace so that people knew what their zone was. I thought that was overkill. But, you know, we have to work with our HR departments, we have to work with our senior management and see what their level of comfort is because that's how we're gonna determine what's gonna work best for our company. Do we take chairs out of a conference room? Is that productive? Do we move to more video conferencing even at the desktop in the facility so that yes, we're there, but we're not, you know, in, in, we're not at home. So we have access to additional um, equipment and whatever files and information that sometimes can't be taken home or used remotely. So it, it's really the individual companies that have to look at that. But it, it always interests me. I, I keep thinking about the circles on the floor because that really was, uh, you know, kind of uh, not in my thought pattern, but, you know, not only did I see that, but somebody as a joke sent me a picture of a woman where, you know, from the 18th century wearing one of those big skirts and saying social distancing. Is that what it's going to come to? Right, right. Who knows? So, but at least it was a fun thought. Yeah. So Des, you, in, in preparing for this, um, this webinar, you had mentioned that your company is doing something uh, for kind of controlling the circulation within your office. Yeah, we're looking, and just in preparation, people going back, we're looking at a number of uh, options, uh, including, you know, perspex. We, we have the lower um, cubicles. We're looking at, you know, putting perspex dividers and along the side and that. We're looking at uh, circulation patterns, maybe put arrows on the floor. So mm -hmm. you have almost a one-way pattern, um, which might be a little bit awkward uh, at the start because it's quite a big core. But, and you, you, you know, you follow that pattern going through various uh, areas on the floor just to just to uh, minimize the, uh, the cross, you know, the, the passing of people, that's where the, the highest risk of, um, of a transfer or, you know, contagion uh, occurs. So if people are in the same, same pattern, it, you know, it, um, it, it produces that risk. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, less turbulence. <laughs> to add, to keep it simple, what Debbie said, uh, we're looking at removing chairs every other cubicle. Just mm -hmm. remove the chairs yeah. and 
relocating people just to get getting back to keep it simple make it easy to do get too many the circles remind me of a little kid's game when you're a little kid <laughs> it's going to be interesting you need a traffic light to get to navigate but yeah. um, i was thinking just, just keep it simple i, I like i like that the the, the the whole thought process for all of this because if it's too complicated no one's going to follow it so yeah. that makes sense yeah. It is and it's important that you have signage around your facility so that people know what they're supposed to be doing. And mm -hmm. that should also be communicated in your communications to your employees so that they know this is what's expected. But people need reminders because we, we quickly forget. So, oh, yeah. you sure. know, Absolutely. having the signage to say this is what our, our new pattern is for circulation or, you know, signs in the conference rooms. You know, this conference room is for four occupants where it was previously for eight or ten so that people are very much aware that this is what needs to be done. You know, maybe at some point, once the vaccine comes out, we'll be able to start adding chairs back in. Mm -hmm. But for now, we have to think the worst case scenarios and what's going to make the, the majority of our employees comfortable enough to want to come back into the workplace. Understood. Yeah. So, um, Debbie, I'm going to stay with you. Uh, I want to kind of bring this back a little bit to sustainability and energy efficiency. Um, what is the COVID-19 effect on sustainability and what does this mean to the general population? Well, it's interesting because the first place I went was to the Global Carbon Project because they track all of the quantity of greenhouse gases globally. And because of the pandemic and everybody working from home and tra less travel and so forth, they're saying that we can estimate between five and 7% drop in carbon monoxide emissions for 2020. And I've had some people say, oh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but people forget, yes, we're not traveling and yes, we're not going into the offices, but what about all the power that we use from our house residentially or wherever we're sheltering? Because, you know, we're all plugged in, uh, you know, we have our laptops, we have our iPads, we have our cell phones, we have our landlines. So, you know, and that's on top of our refrigerators and everything else. And when you're not home, you're not going in and out. So the energy use is less. So being home, are we going in and out more? Is that increasing our energy levels? So I think that five to 7% is, you know, something that sounds like it's realistic. The question is, how long can we sustain it? Because when we start to go back into the workplace, then we're going to have increases in energy use and increases in CO2 and emissions. And we need to be conscientious of that. Sure. So uh, getting back to what with the, uh, you know, upgrades to the building and HVAC and installing of new monitoring systems and cleaning equipment, et cetera, uh, my thought is the, it's going to affect energy use um, in that we're going to be using more of it. Well, right? that's just it. We, there's, there's the, you know, we're adding additional technologies and new equipment into our workplace, which is going to increase. But we have to keep in mind, again, that whole, you know, we're going to be coming into the workplace in phases. And so the energy use will initially be low until we get back to full capacity. And so, you know, if we don't have people, but yet we're flushing our systems and we're using more, that kind of evens out. So it's not quite as, um, as much as one would think, but we still need to be tracking it, especially with Local Law 97 coming into mm -hmm. play. And uh, specifically for the people that may be on the call that are not from New York, Local Law 97 is an initiative from the city of New York where all buildings over um, 25,000 square feet have specific, um, uh, what do you call it, target reductions that they have to meet by certain deadlines. The first one is 2025 and 2030. And if you don't meet these deadlines of reducing your carbon emissions, there's hefty fines to be paid. So you know, this is why when you work with your consultants, you want to make sure that they're working with the latest ASHRAE, that they're looking at energy efficiencies, they're looking to make sure that your upgrades are going to be within the limits. Because remember, the building owner is the ultimate 
person who's responsible for the, for the new local meeting local law 97, but how much of that is going to be passed on to the tenants? And we have to really look at our leases and see what is our responsibility because you're going to see CAM charges are going to go up. You're going to see that they're going to have miscellaneous fees for things that you have no idea what they are. So as we've been saying at the Voice of the Tenant programs, now's the time to talk to your landlords, not only about what's in their plan for re-entry, but what's in their plan for Local Doll 97, and what can you do to partner to be able to maybe defray costs. You know, tell us up front that if we're going to contribute to the upgrades and to adding some of these uh, new technologies for health and safety into the workplace, that you know, if you're going to get energy efficiencies to the building and that's going to reduce your electrical use, I want to be able to take advantage of that. I want to be able as a tenant to say, okay, if my landlord is buying renewable energy or buying blocks and hedges, which we all know now is the time to buy because the rates are low and you'll see that they'll start to rise very quickly as soon as we start to go back into the workplace, but you can lock in now for 2021 and beyond, and that way you can reduce your costs. And now's also a good time to look at, well, what other options do you have for renewable energy that could also reduce your energy costs? And the savings can help defray some of the costs of some of the upgrades. So that's, that's amazing stuff. I mean, our, I'd love to be able to give people links on on these well, I was blocks just and say, these hedges. So um, everyone, you know, be able you should to... be for 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 buying energy. You should be talking to an energy consultant or a broker and let them guide you. You probably should be going out to bid based on your consumption and your locations because depending on what zone you're in, there's different pricing. Because like for instance, New York City is zone J and that's one of the highest for utilities. But if you go out into the suburbs, the costs are less. So you really have to look at what's the history of your building, what's the consumption at the building, the location in that specific building, and then work with your energy consultants to say, yes, it makes sense based on my square footage and based on my usage data centers it's a no-brainer if you have um, MDFs and IDFs in your workplace those are consumers of a large amount of energy you'll want to really look at it because those are areas where you could see that if you're you know using different um, it, technologies your energy will go up but if the cost goes down and also you are still got to look at efficiencies to make sure you're controlling the CO2 and everything else to meet the local law 97. And the good news is that at least in New York we have various ways of getting help. Number one is NYSERDA. They're doing energy audits, they have cost sharing programs, and as long as things are you know working towards energy savings, they'll be willing to help with those types of programs. They have virtual and remote audits available because people are saying, well, nobody's going into the office, but if your chief engineer has access to his BMS and the building systems, there can be enough information that they can work with you on these audits remotely without anybody being there. Or maybe one or two people go in, take pictures, you have a video chat, you carry around your computer and you're able to, you know, your laptop and you're able to share whatever information is needed. The other thing is you have the New York City um, retrofit accelerator program. So anything that's energy related, they have free services available for New York for both landlords and tenants. And on the sheet that we're giving out after the program that lists resources, we've listed the websites. One of the websites that we didn't list was the Green Bank, which is a subsidiary of NYSERDA. They have funds available that, you know, it's a loan, you have to pay it back. But in most instances, the loans are paid back 
within your lease commitment and it's paid through your landlord. So, um, you know, it's not like you're paying them back directly and they have programs so that you're paying, you know, minimal amounts. The interest rates are considerably low compared to your standard bank and loan institutions. So those are great resources. And obviously if you're outside of the city of New York, you're gonna to wanna to look to your local and state um, authorities and question them what type of programs that they have and take advantage because now's the time to do it, especially if you're doing upgrades, you know, where you don't have to move people because you can access ceilings and floors because of the empty spaces. Right, good point. Well, if I could just add to that, New York yeah. City just enacted a brand new energy code, the 2020 energy code on May 12th. So, and it has criteria for circuiting receptacles and enhanced criteria for if you're going to change lighting now, this is more stringent. So you have to look at some of that stuff in conjunction with some of the energy savings and also the local utility companies. Con Edison has um, rebate savings programs for different things that may yes, be Yes, and in fact, mm -hmm. also, if I can interject, Con Edison has where if you're buying LED lighting, they have resources where you can get up to 50% discounts if you buy the products through one of the authorized distributors. So you really should go to the Con Ed website for additional information on lighting. Yeah, we'll make sure that we have those links um, in, in what we send out. Okay, so we're pretty much done with, um, with the questions here. Uh, we have 12 minutes before the end of the hour. Um, Michaela and Kaylee, I see that we've got some questions here. Were there any that, that jumped out at you? Um, that seem to be common questions. Uh, okay. I don't think we have too many common themes here, but okay. we can send over a few questions regarding the UV lighting um, and the difference between the UVC lighting. Uh, UV lighting versus UVC, UVA versus UVC? This person says that, uh, was asking the difference between the UV lighting and the UVC lighting. Perfect, okay. Know, which could be um, used during business hours. Yeah, the, the, UV, um, the UVC lighting is a higher intensity uh, light. Um, you know, it's typically, it's the UV light that's filtered by the ozone layer in the atmosphere. Um, has a shorter wavelength than UVA and UV, UVB, which is the light that gives you a suntan or a, a sunburn in my case. Um, so the, the UVC light is, is very intense. It goes into the, the unit uh, and shines on the coil to, 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 uh, to kill uh, the um, bacteria and viruses that are sitting on the coil. Um, Richard, you know uh, about the, about the I, I, I'm assuming that it's the same UVC light that is installed in the light fixture sitting above, um, you know, above seven feet. Yes, that's the same. Yeah. And that's why, you know, just as part of the uh, considering UVC light uh, sitting above in the ceiling, the control of that is really important. And uh, when, when that's operated and, and when it's not and, and how that whole um, system is controlled, because it can be, can be harmful. But it's all the same light, yeah. So there's uh, this gentleman, um, Mark Figelman, he had a couple of questions here. So he, he asks about UVA versus UVC and then he says, uh, an eczema lamps versus pulse xenon technology for HVAC disinfection. Do you guys have any comments about that? I have come across, I'm not that familiar with it. Uh, I know there is a xenon uh, pulse light. Um, I, I can't comment or, or, or uh, respond to it. I don't have enough information. I'm not familiar with it. They may be manufacturer specific type yeah. stuff. I, I yeah. don't really have any direct information on it. Um, mm -hmm. There is a number of guides uh, to UV design and lighting and a number of major manufacturers. I can, you know, we can dig out some of those links yeah. for everybody to take. I'm familiar really with some of the manufacturers, but I just haven't used them yeah. before. Uh, exactly. not familiar with the, the okay. technology. So maybe and that's and something Ash, that we can Ash, have Ash, a on. Yeah, and Ashray recommends uh, UVC uh, yeah. in their position paper. Okay. Exactly. Uh, so the same gentleman says, uh, virus and bacterium thrive in human, humid environments. Conversely, dry air allows the organisms to be disturbed. Dis 
dispersed more easily. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. thoughts on adjustments to humidification? I know, Des, this is something that you talked about. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so, so the ideal, um, I guess, when you look at the, um, and that's a really good point, and it's 100% it's correct. When you look at the, the trend of, uh, of, of viruses, even the flu season, the flu season is uh, when the flu season starts to peak is when the humidity levels in the atmosphere drop. So um, that's one of the reasons where it's very contagious during the winter because the, the humidity levels, especially in on the East Coast, New York, and you know, we have 20, 15 percent relative humidity. Um, conversely, when it's more humid out during the during the uh, spring and summer, the, it's less contagious. Um, and the ideal um, humidity to maintain in a space to uh, to minimize uh, contagion is between 40 and 60 um, percent relative humidity. Um, if you can keep a, a space of 40 percent humidity, you can reduce the um, occasion of of contagion by 40 percent. Um, it's it's Ideal, it's something that you can do in a clean room environment or a, a surgical area. It's, it's very difficult to do in a, an existing building. Um, you, have to, you have to have vapor barriers. You basically have to seal the building um, from the inside to the out, uh, outside. Even, even then, it's, it's very difficult to maintain the humidity within that space. Uh, so the ideal, ideal humidity level is 46%. If you can do that, you know, in newer buildings, a new construction, if you can maintain it somehow, uh, it's ideal, but it's, um, it's very difficult to retrofit that in existing floors of buildings. We, we've looked yeah. at it before, it's very expensive. Yeah. And, and the risk with the existing building is that if you start overpressurizing your building and you increase your humidity levels, you risk of having condensation in your walls and mm -hmm. causing mold issues, which, which is not... Uh, which is bad too. Yes. yes. Yeah. Some of the sensor technology can help you with some of that um, and look at different areas and times of day to occupy and summer it's easy, winter is difficult. And a lot of the older buildings, the humidification systems that may have been installed or abandoned and taken out for a lot of these same reasons due to maintenance yeah. and everything else. So, so it's really, it, it really needs a thorough review as to if you're going to embark and even think about doing humidification in the winter and so in, in, in buildings in this area. Just to add to that, Jessica, there is a, a really good, um, one, of, one of the best presentations I've seen uh, by a, a Dr. Stephanie Taylor, I, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, it's on the ASHRAE website and it's, it's on YouTube, actually. Yeah. Uh, she does a really, really detailed, really interesting um, uh, presentation about the effects of uh, relative humidity. Um, and uh, infections, the rate of infections within uh, hospitals. So it's yeah, really, it's really, really worth it. Really yeah. good. Okay, we'll make sure that we get a link. Sure, I'll, I to can that. send you. Um, so there's another question. Uh, there are concerns about airflow and velocity playing a role in spreading the virus. Should velocities be reduced with regard to induct slash in unit disinfection methodologies? How careful do you need to be with duct size and air velocity? Is, preferential is it preferential to use UV lamps on the return side of the unit, which typically has lower velocities? Well, when you're sizing it, you know, and, and that's a good point, when you're sizing any disinfection uh, uh, system for, for a unit or a, a distribution system, you got to look at it in real detail um, and design it very carefully and make sure it's installed very carefully. Um, UVC wise, um, the UVG should should be um, installed at the coil, preferably uh, downstream of the coil. Uh, that's where most of the, the uh, bacteria and virus are. Um, and the reason that you do have the cooling coil is because it's, it's like a catch and kill um, system. The, um, the damp or the wet coil will catch dust particles where the viruses are riding on, bacteria are riding on. And with the intense light and the exposure time, it really needs exposure time. Um, you uh, that's the way you kill it. Um, UVGI is less effective or not effective uh, in in air streams. So if you put on the ductwork, you need a, a really really long um, length of UVC lamp to be any way effective uh, within a within a within a duct stream. But um, typically the 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 even at five hundred feet per minute, which is typically the the return or the velocities that you're talking about in a 
around a, a mechanical uh, unit. Um, it's still, depending on what system you use, the UVGA, UVGI on its own will not um, eradicate the, the bacteria in the air. Okay. Does anybody want to add to that? I think there's another part of the question was about air flows and velocity yeah. of air flows. Um, so we have to be careful here because if you increase your ventilation rates, uh, you don't want to necessarily increase your airflow rates. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're if you're moving the air too much in the space, you can have transmission between occupants if the air moves in an uncontrolled way. So you have to be careful with that. Okay. Also, because it deals with settling, also settling of the, you know, if you have moisture or um, stuff being given off from people, there's, there's a whole settling effect that you have to really look at with low velocities on surfaces and then the thought, cleaning comes into play. Yeah. So. I don't, but I don't think, uh, you know, uh, Chris or Richard, that I don't think uh, changing the method of design that we have at the moment in, as an industry standard is... Uh, is going to affect that much. I mean, it's, yeah, it's been I agree. It's designed. Their velocities are and and um, vendors and catalogs are are carefully um, designed so that there is a, a the correct airflow. If you you know you all, all, you have to design a system to have correct airflow anyway. So I don't think uh, changing the air velocities um, is going to have a huge impact. No, and there's, okay. there will be a focus on what Ashley calls uh, uh, airflow uh, effectiveness, ventilation effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yes. You have to aim for the the, the, the better. Uh, effectiveness. Okay. And it looks like we have uh, time for one more question. Um, it's about the uh, energy impact of flushing, which we sort of talked about a little bit in, in the original part, but also frequency. Um, and does the air need to be heated or cooled depending on the season when you're flushing? Um, yes. So uh, frequency. Um, According to ASHRAE's recommendations, while the buildings are empty um, and coming up to uh, our day, um, they recommend running 100% dilution as much as possible. And that's 24-7 if you can do that. Obviously, there's going to be a cost and energy impact to the building. Um, maybe consider doing it a few hours every day. Um, in, and in terms of mechanical uh, cooling and heating, depending on the, on the outside conditions, you're certainly going to have to... Um, um, run mechanical cooling and heating um, yeah. to well, just to temper the air. Some of the studies have shown that it, in an untempered environment, it affects people way more with the disease transmission than a tempered environment. For instance, the 46% mm -hmm. relative humidity. And so, so definitely you're going to have to temper the air. You have other ancillary concerns, sprinklers, freezing of mm -hmm. elements in the building, things like that, that you just really can't ignore. So uh, as a side issue, yeah. Um, so that, that in terms of yeah. looked at, in terms of frequency, um, you know, I, I think it's it's a really good idea, if you can, to um, make it part of a, a regular dilution maybe cycle during the at yeah. night when the space is unoccupied and the, and the air temperatures are cooler, and maybe mm -hmm. for a couple of hours just to just to clean out the uh, the air, the stagnant air. Think of it as extended hours. Yeah. That's what we've been talking to people about. Think of mm -hmm. running extended hours past your whatever your normal occupancy would be, as many hours as you can actually evaluate and 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 address from a budget cost standpoint, an energy standpoint, and operations standpoint. Yeah, and half hours you don't have to cool the air as much as you would do during the occupied time. So yes, you just temp exactly. it. So in the summer you can reduce the air at seventy-five degrees discharge, eighty degrees, and and, and, and a lot of buildings have set back functions built into their BMS systems already that could be utilized for this, um, dealing with, you know, night setback for heating and cooling that, that could be run at those times just to move the air through. So, yeah. And you can also use that opportunity to do some uh, pre-cooling uh, before people come in the building in the yeah. morning. Yeah. Or pre-heating. Yeah, that's smart. Let's kill two birds with one stone. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're coming to the hour. Uh, I just wanted to say that this is going to be um, part of a series of webinars and uh, the questions that we weren't able to answer or maybe we want to expand upon them, they'll inform the next group of webinars uh, about really getting back to work, air, air quality, water, a whole bunch of different things. And um, they may or may not be part of sustainability, but we're definitely going to be progressing with these webinars. With IFMA, and we'd love to do another one with you guys at BOMA. Um, 
So I just want to say thank you very much for everyone for taking part. I appreciate all the effort in the past uh, week that it took for us to get to this spot and organizing all of the questions and teaching me <laughs> a lot of things. Um, I really do appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate everybody who signed on to the webinar. Uh, I hope it was useful information. I think it probably was. Um, John and Des and Chris, Richard, Debbie, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Jessica. Jessica, having us. Thank you. I want to thank, thank you, you on behalf of everybody because yes. the amount of time you had to pull this together was really wow. short. And I think you did a really good job of getting us all together and organizing all of the information so that hopefully it was helpful to everyone who participated. Well thank you so here. much, guys. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. See you guys. Have a good day. Bye. See you. Have Take a care. great day, everybody, and stay Bye. safe.